Good afternoon. Uh, I'm very pleased to have you here on September 6th, the first event of the academic year 23-24. Uh, my name is Geneviève Zubrisky. I'm the William Sewell Collegiate Professor of Sociology and the director of the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. The Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia is dedicated to the advancement and dissemination of knowledge about and public engagement with the institutions, cultures, and histories of Europe and Eurasia. And we have prepared a very rich program of lectures, events, roundtables, and exhibits this fall. Um, I hope you saw when you entered the room, we have uh, uh, copies of our calendar. If you haven't taken one, please take one before leaving because we have really important programming. Um, and it's uh, an honor to launch this year's program uh, with such a distinguished speaker, Attorney General of Ireland, Rosa Fanning. We're grateful to our colleagues and co-sponsors at the law school for making today's event uh, possible. Um, before introducing our speaker, I'd like to welcome special guests with us this, this afternoon, the Honorable Eileen Weiser, the University of Michigan's Vice President and General Counsel, Timothy Lynch, in the back hiding, um, and also Ambassador Susan Page, who's uh, Acting Director of of the other Wiser Center, the Wiser Center for Diplomacy and the Four School of Public Policy. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Rosa Fanning was appointed Attorney General of Ireland in December 2022, and in that capacity, he serves as a legal advisor to the government and acts as the chief law officer of the state. Prior to his appointment as Attorney General, he was a senior counsel in private practice at the Irish Bar, with caseloads spanning commercial law, public law and judicial review, professional negligence, product liability, defamation, and privacy law. Attorney General Fanning was a recipient of several prestigious fellowships, awards, and distinctions, including a Fulbright Fellowship, the Swift McNeil Memorial Prize, and the John Brooks Scholar Award. He was educated at the world's finest institutions, including the University of Michigan, where he obtained an LLM. For those of you not acquainted with that, those of you not in the law school or in law, it's a master's of law. Uh, and he obtained this from the University of Michigan in 2000. And just chatting with him um, before the lecture, I was glad to hear that he uh, visited um, the stores of Ann Arbor. Uh, he got a lot of swag from the U of M, and before you leave, you'll have to get a Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia t-shirt. It's the best one, best quality, best fit, I promise. So we're incredibly pleased that uh, he has accepted our invitation to share his reflections on Ireland's unique geopolitical position, uh, and thrilled to have him with us today in Ann Arbor. So please uh, join me in offering Attorney General Rosa Fanning a warm Michigan welcome. Thank you. Genevieve, um, it, it's a somewhat tiresome convention for visiting lecturers to say how happy and honored they are to be invited to a particular institution to give an address but only on this occasion the sentiment is entirely authentic. Um, so thank you so much to the Wiser Centre for having me this afternoon. As you've just been told, I was an LLM student in the law school uh, 24 years ago. It was one of the great experiences of my life. And to have returned to Michigan this week uh, for the first time in almost a quarter of a century to participate in the teaching of a couple of classes in the law school and to give you this address this afternoon is a singular honour. My visit this week has stirred up some uh, very happy memories for me, but two memories that are, in fact, unbearably sad. And I just wanted to mention this week, uh, or, or I wanted to mention this afternoon that I've been thinking this week of two contemporaries that I knew well in the law school who died tragically young, Jenny Runkles, who died in an automobile accident in 2001, and Dan Goldman, a great friend of mine the year I was in the law school who died of pancreatic cancer in 2013. When I left Ann Arbor uh, 
for the last time as a student in May of 2000. Uh, Jenny insisted on driving me to the airport and it was to be the last time I saw her. Uh, on a much happier note, the first person I ever met when I came to Michigan 24 years ago as a student was a guy called Matt Riccardi who I met in the Lawyers Club uh, and I had two drinks with him on, in Manhattan on m Monday night this week. He remains one of the many uh, great friends that I met during my time here. Moreover, whilst I was a student here 24 years ago, I did make the sensible decision to subscribe for a season ticket to the uh, college football in the big house. And on the 2nd of October 1999, I was present to see Michigan win 38 to 12 against a team visiting from Purdue. The talk was all about their highly regarded starting quarterback by the name of Drew Brees, who was said to have a big future ahead of him even then. But on the day, he was outshone by some significant margin by the Michigan quarterback, uh, sadly too slow to make a successful career out of it in the NFL, uh, named Tom Brady. So um, viewed against that backdrop, it's regrettably clear that I've um, greatly underachieved in my career when you benchmark it against the uh, careers that some of my near contemporaries have had. But nonetheless, it was a great honor for me to be invited uh, to join Ireland's cabinet as Attorney General by the Irish Prime Minister, or Taoiseach, uh, where I've been serving since December. Now, um, in terms of what I'm going to say to you this afternoon, the title of my lecture self-consciously echoes the words of a well-known former Irish minister who famously observed the proposition that Ireland was closer to Boston than Berlin, using those cities as metaphors for the different cultural, legal, and political traditions represented on the one hand by the United States and on the other hand by the uh, continental European tradition. And the phrase that Ireland is closer to Boston than Berlin has often been quoted by economists, lawyers, journalists, and politicians when considering the triangular relationship between Ireland, the United States, and the European Union. Now, I decided, of course, in deference to the fact that I'm visiting this great state, that the phrase required some tweaking um, to reflect the fact that I'm in Michigan without losing its alliterative quality. So for that reason today, I'm posing the only slightly modified question of whether Ireland is closer to Michigan or Madrid. Now, it is, of course, the case that a facile answer to the question is that we're closer to Madrid. It's slightly less than half the distance. And so I could end the lecture just about there. But that's not the point of my inquiry. It's not a, a literal inquiry. Instead, I'm asking with more of a focus on Ireland's legal and political reference points where our influences are more derived from. And in this talk, I will talk quite a bit about law, but not in a way that hopefully alienates non-lawyers. Um, it's not a legal lecture as such, but I am a lawyer and a law professor by background, and I will make some legal comment, but hopefully in a way that's accessible for a general audience. So let me begin with a banal and obvious proposition um, that Ireland and the United States have an awful lot in common. Um, it's a proposition so obvious that it's almost capable of being overlooked, but Ireland and the United States speaks the same language. And that in itself is very important when you compare what you have in common with continental countries on Europe, as it were on one side of you, to the United States on the other side. The media you consume, the news you read, is very often influenced by language more than distance. And um, also, another really important and obvious point is that by reason of Ireland's well-documented extensive history of emigration, according to the most recent US census figure, uh, almost 31 and a half million Americans assert Irish ancestry. That's about nine and a half percent of the American population, almost a million of them in the state of Michigan. Now, the cultural links between the two countries, Ireland and the United States, remain as a consequence extremely pronounced and extremely visible. I had the privilege of meeting President Biden himself uh, when he visited Ireland for four days in April in a visit that was um, covered extensively by international media. And 10 days ago, and this is a somewhat delicate confession to make on my return to Michigan, uh, I did find myself amongst the audience at the Notre Dame Navy, 
uh, football game which was played in, in front of a capacity stadium in Dublin. 40,000 Irish Americans traveled to Dublin for that game. The largest exodus of Americans to attend any sporting event anywhere in the world ever, uh, which is extraordinary when you think of it, but there you are. That's 40,000 people who came, uh, providing about a $175 million uh, dollar boost to the Irish economy just in one week's visit alone. So um, these obvious cultural reference points are in front of us all the time, and we can see them. Um, at a slightly more academic um, level, uh, I might observe that the links between the United States and Ireland are inextricably bound up in the history of both countries and indeed their respective struggles for independence. Both countries share the distinction of having built independent, self-governing republics in places which were once the control or subject to the control of the British Empire and the Westminster Parliament. Both countries only managed to assert independence after fighting their own wars of independence. And the precise details of the circumstances in which Ireland and the United States respectively had to engage in wars of independence have been considered in decisions of the Irish Supreme Court. In a case called Melling and O'Maha Magauna, uh, Judge O'Dolig, uh, a distinguished Irish judge who uniquely became both Chief Justice and President of Ireland, drew a distinction between the respective relationships of the United States and Ireland with Britain. He appeared to suggest in his judgment that the departure of the United States from the British Empire was a choice made with some reluctance in contrast to Ireland. He said that the United States of 1775, which emerged as a republic, looked upon itself as securing to itself the rights and privileges of the glorious revolution of 1688. A once happy colony was being driven by the selfish taxation policies of the Westminster government to sever its connections with the homeland. The parting was made in sorrow as the recitals to the Declaration of Independence bear witness. Now, I'm not sure if everybody in this audience would necessarily agree with the rather cheerful description of the United States as having been a once happy colony of the United Kingdom. And more recently, in a different judgment of the Irish Supreme Court, Chief Justice Keane gave a more sanguine account of the severing of the political relationship of the United States from uh, the United Kingdom. He said in a case called Maguire and Arda, I would have thought that the measured cadences in which the rebellious American offspring bade farewell to the motherland lost at least some of their resonance during the bloody war of independence and can hardly have been of much comfort when the British sacked Washington during the war of 1812. Now, I'll come back in due course to the reason why the Irish Supreme Court has had reason to consider so closely the circumstances in which American independence came about. But on achieving independence, both Ireland and the United States, I think it's fair to say, have at times sought to define themselves in opposition to the United Kingdom. From the perspective of governance, though, some of the strongest links between the United States and Ireland are as a result of the shared legal heritage that both countries inherited from English law. Both the United States and Ireland have common law legal systems that follow established rules of precedent. In both systems, the cases are not merely the application of law to a specific dispute. Quite simply, in our legal systems, the cases are the law. Both jurisdictions rely on generalist courts that hear disputes of all types between ordinary citizens, companies, and echoing the legacy of the famous English jurist Dicey, institutions of government as well. Both jurisdictions adopt the model of the adversarial trial as the best mechanism for testing opposing arguments and evidence to allow courts to make decisions in accordance with the demands of justice. And in this system, it's the parties, not the court, that determines what evidence will be advanced, what arguments will be raised. The judge must act as a neutral umpire over robust exchanges between opposing lawyers. This broad theme, though, of shared legal heritage that Ireland and the United States 
inherited from Britain, is not without nuance and subtlety. The different countries have done different things with that inheritance. We've each kept different parts of it and jettisoned other parts. So in many respects, I think the overall observation is that Ireland's legal and political system has not strayed as far from the British inheritance as the American system has. And why might you ask that question, or why one might ask, is that the position? Well, in another Irish Supreme Court judgment called Re-Irish Employers Mutual Insurance Association, Judge Kingsmill Moore observed as follows, the admitted reproduction in the Irish Constitution of many of the features of the British Constitution is more properly attributable partially to a genuine appreciation of the inherent excellence of those features and partially to the fact that the Constitution had much of the nature of a compromise between British and Irish views. In other words, it might be said that um, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So to give you one very visible constitutional example that everybody, lawyers or non-lawyers, can readily understand, whilst Ireland does have a directly elected president, the functions of that office are not remotely comparable to the functions of the President of the United States. In truth, save for a very small number of residual powers which are specified in the Constitution, the Irish President's political function resembles that of the British monarch and is largely ceremonial in nature. The real political power in a parliamentary system such as Ireland's is vested in the Prime Minister, just in the same way that that is the important political office in London. The Irish Taoiseach, or Prime Minister, holds a political office that in effect in constitutional terms closely resembles that of the English Prime Minister and is much closer to that than it is a comparison to the American presidential system. There are some matters though where Ireland has diverged from the British model and the United States has not. Take for instance the voting system. In England the MPs are elected in what we call first past the post uh, single member constituencies with no reference to proportional representation. And that electoral method is in effect what's employed when you have elections for individual members of Congress. But that's radically different from the Irish model, which uses a, a proportional representation system in multi-member constituencies uh, and a single transferable vote. But that's an exception. Uh, more examples are of the reverse. And it's perhaps unsurprising, I think, that Ireland is still in political and constitutional terms closer to Britain than America. Uh, after all, Irish independence was achieved more recently, much more recently than the United States, almost 150 years after the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Depending on your view of matters, Irish independence was obtained in 1922 or 1937. American ties to Britain were cut much more abruptly and much more comprehensively on attaining independence. Um, as Chief Justice Keane put it in Maguire and Arda, what was of far more significance in the constitutional history of the United States was the complete and surgical severance from the motherland reflected in the Constitution. In stark contrast to what happened to Ireland in 1922, Every single link with the empire was broken and a republican form of government established with an elected president as head of state and chief executive. Furthermore, as Judge Kingsmill Moore in Ireland alluded to in a passage I quoted above, Ireland had at one stage participated in the Westminster parliamentary system. Ireland elected MPs to the Westminster parliament. So that institutional memory may have played an important part in shaping the institutional choices made at the time of the foundation of the Irish state, and of course the inescapable reality of geographic proximity may have played a factor too. So in short, an overall assessment is this. Um, the Irish legal, political, constitutional system is still closer in many ways uh, to Britain's than it is to the United States's. However, whilst this pattern 
of similarity and difference is complex, there is, I think, at least one important respect in which the legal systems of the United States and Ireland have diverged from that of the UK in more or less the same direction. In both Ireland and the United States, there is a single authoritative canonical constitutional text that commits both jurisdictions um, uh, to specific institutions of government and specific uh, rules in terms of the defense of human rights. Both countries have written constitutions and both countries in setting down written constitutions in the way that they have mark a fairly dramatic and significant change from the British tradition of an unwritten constitution based on a combination of statute law and convention that has evolved over centuries. It's not an inevitable feature of written constitutions that they allow for judicial review of legislation, but as is evident from the history of the United States and Ireland, a written constitution undoubtedly makes judicial review more viable. And whilst this practice has been the subject of academic and political criticism, at times people say judges overreach and overstep the mark and intrude into the political domain, um, the words of Chief Justice John Marshall in Marbury and Madison, that a law repugnant to the Constitution is void and courts as well as other departments of government are bound by that instrument, are still words that are echoed in the cut and thrust of legal argument and judicial decisions in both Ireland and the United States. The Irish Constitution of 1937 provides, in fact, a much more explicit invitation to the judiciary to engage in judicial review than does its American counterpart. Article 15.4.1 of the Irish Constitution provides that the legislature shall not enact any law which is in any respect repugnant to the Constitution or any provision thereof. And the next article, Article 15.4.2, provides that every law enacted by the Oireachtas, which is in any respect repugnant to this Constitution, shall, but to the extent only of such repugnancy, be invalid. So there's an express stipulation in the Constitution that an act passed by Parliament that conflicts with the Constitution is void and invalid. So that brings us to, in effect, a similar political place to the United States in terms of the function of the Irish Supreme Court uh, as compared to the US Supreme Court. Um, there was a reticence initially, I think, on the part of Irish judges to go um, in that direction. And they were slow after the 1937 Constitution to sort of engage with the power that had been bestowed amongst, uh, upon them. But in a case called State, Burke and Lennon, the um, Supreme Court grasped the nettle. In that case, the applicants were arrested and they were detained under the authority of an order made by the Irish Minister for Justice. The minister had made this order using a power conferred by something called Section 55 of the Offences Against the State Act 1939. And a judge in the High Court ordered the release of the applicants on a habeas corpus application on the basis that the power contained in Section 55 was repugnant to the Constitution. And the finding was that it offended against the separation of powers by in effect conferring on the executive power to administer justice, which ought to be reserved to the courts under Article 34 of the Constitution. And the interesting thing about that is that in this groundbreaking decision, the judge who first decides this important proposition refers to a treatise on American constitutional law by somebody called Professor Willoughby, who was an early US constitutional scholar and a founder of the first political science department in the world, really, at John Hopkins University. So you see from the get-go that there's an American influence permeating the intellectual proposition that courts in Ireland have the power to strike down legislation. And it quickly became clear that this decision wasn't an anomaly. It, it was part of the state's constitutional order. It was followed by another decision in Buckley and the Attorney General. 
in which the courts struck down legislation which purported to determine the outcome of a live legal dispute on the basis that that was a legislative interference with the judicial power. And in Buckley, the influence of American law was particularly apparent. One author has consulted the historical archives and has found that my predecessor as Attorney General um, advised that there were legal risks associated with the legislation, though on balance it was constitutional. And the same scholar who has researched into the case um, almost 80 years later said that the attorney was clearly concerned about the constitutional issue and lengthy and indeed learned memoranda were subsequently prepared dealing with comparable issues from US constitutional law. So here we have in the 1940s an Irish attorney general considering the question of whether Irish law is repugnant to the Irish constitution but considering that question by reference to comparable American decisions. And it appears in particular that my predecessor had regard to a decision of the United States Supreme Court in a case called Ex parte McArdle, which was a habeas corpus application from a prisoner seeking his release from military detention in Mississippi after the Civil War. Congress feared that the application would risk invalidating the military government which was overseeing the reconstruction, and it therefore enacted legislation which repealed the appellate jurisdiction which had been invoked by the prisoner, and this had the intended result in the US Supreme Court. Now that might have seemed like firm ground for the government, but the outcome in the Irish Supreme Court sounds a cautionary tale about relying too heavily on persuasive precedents from other jurisdictions. Whilst in summary, and we could be here for some time if I went through all of the examples, um, the Irish and US courts have not always decided cases in the same way, but there is a clear pattern of influence and fruitful engagement between the courts um, on both sides of the Atlantic. And this is particularly so from what is um, described as the sort of Warren Court era in the United States. In the 1960s onwards, in both the, the United States and in Ireland, there were strong activist courts um, that led a lot of social change. The Warren Court ordered the desegregation of schools and uh, educational institutions divided along racial lines. It invalidated prohibitions on uh, interracial marriages, miscegnation mis statutes as they were called, uh, and cohabitation. Uh, beyond the area of civil rights, the Warren Court enhanced the freedom of expression for journalists to free speech in the context of defamation law. Um, upheld rights of privacy to allow access to contraception, protected the right to vote against malapportionment of um, uh, rotten boroughs and um, disproportionate congressional districts. And in Ireland around the same time, it was the Supreme Court led by Carol O'Dolig which developed a doctrine of unenumerated rights which started to afford constitutional protection to an expansive and open-ended list of rights not expressly identified in the Irish Constitution as such. And this sort of parallel liberal trajectory from the Irish Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court at around the same time occurred in different societies and for somewhat different reasons. But there's absolutely no doubt that the Irish case was influenced by the American case. And more recent academic work has shone light in particular on a relationship between two judges on the respective courts. One of the leading Irish judges for 30 years on the Supreme Court was Mr. Justice Brian Walsh, and he developed a friendship with an Irish-American judge named Justice Brennan, who was a, a longtime uh, Supreme Court judge. And it's well documented now that after meeting him at a dinner when he was on a visit to Ireland, uh, Judge Walsh stru struck up a friendship with Judge Brennan, uh, Justice Brennan's parents had emigrated to the United States from County Roscommon in the west of Ireland, uh, and he had strong Irish links and connections. The two judges engaged in frequent correspondence which often discussed their work. Their letters frequently enclosed advanced copies of judgments and opinions delivered by their respective courts, and this collaboration ultimately becomes evident in the actual output. So, for instance, 
In the Irish case of McGee and the Attorney General, the Irish Supreme Court determined that the absolute prohibition on the importation of contraception into the state amounted to an unconstitutional interference with the constitutionally protected right to marital privacy. And if you read the judgments in McGee, they expressly refer to US Supreme Court authority, uh, Griswold in Connecticut, Poe and Ullman, Eisenstadt and Baird. And these links can also be seen in other areas, procedural rights in the context of the criminal process. So the exclusionary rule where the Irish courts will generally exclude evidence that has been obtained in breach of the constitutional rights of a defendant was first adopted in a case called O'Brien in which Judge Walsh and his colleagues drew on analogous jurisprudence from the US, including MAP and Ohio. So whilst there's voluminous case law on this topic from Ireland, that has framed the relevant test in different ways to the way in which it's framed in the United States. Key developments in that kind of area are still normally accompanied by reference to US law. Another example um, is the State Healy and Donoghue, where the Supreme Court decided that the right to trial in due course of law required the state to provide legal aid for a defendant in criminal proceedings who couldn't afford a lawyer. And in reaching that conclusion, the Chief Justice in the Irish Supreme Court, Chief Justice O'Higgins, relied on a very similar conclusion reached by the US Supreme Court in the famous case of Gideon and Wainwright. Even non-lawyers may well have read Anthony Lewis's uh, celebrated book published um, almost 60 years ago called Gideon's Trumpet, published in 1964-65, uh, uh, which interpreted the right to due process in the 14th Amendment as requiring that an impecunious defendant have the assistance of counsel. And um, the Irish court explicitly, again, relies on the American interpretation of the 14th Amendment to draw the conclusion that a similar right was inherent in the Irish Constitution. So there are lots of examples. Um, in his book on the Irish Supreme Court, the editor of the Irish Times, at the equivalent of the New York Times, I suppose, in our jurisdiction, Ruan McCormack, recalls or records that Justice Brennan asked Judge Walsh for a copy of his judgment in a case called State Sheeran and Kennedy. And a reference to the Irish decision of State Sheeran and Kennedy appears in the majority opinion delivered by Justice Fortas, with which Justice Brennan concurs. So there are examples of the movement being in the other direction. Drawing all of these strands together, and I've delved into a, a particular relationship to a certain extent there, I, I think at a high level I might make the following observation. Um, in constitutional law matters, because of our common heritage, because of our common law tradition, because of our written constitutions, and because quite literally the judges speak the same language, US constitutional law has influenced Irish constitutional law. And we have for a long time taken the view that we have more in common with the United States than we have with Britain because of the shared tradition of a written constitution. As Mr. Justice Walsh put it in a case called State Quinn and Rhine, he said, in this state one would have expected that if the approach of any court of final appeal of another state was to have been held up as an example for this court to follow, it would more appropriately have been the Supreme Court of the United States rather than the House of Lords. And I should say in that context, the House of Lords refers to what at that time was the predecessor of the UK Supreme Court. That historic observation is a little bit less pertinent now than it used to be, I think, uh, for one important reason. The UK uh, incorporated the European Convention on Human Rights under the Human Rights Act, and there is now more human rights litigation in the United Kingdom than there was in the 60s or the 70s or the 80s when those decisions I've been talking about were reached. That does mean that judges in the UK are now involved in a practice that is similar but with some, I, I think, significant differences to the type of review of legislation against fundamental rights standards that Irish judges and American judges have been engaged in for much longer. Um, so the material that I've looked at there, I think, um, does at least demonstrate a preoccupation on the part of Irish judges with the question of whether 
Ireland should follow developments in the UK or follow judgments from the United States. Particularly in the early decades of Irish independence, there was almost, I think, an overt desire to follow the law of a jurisdiction other than London as part of an assertion of political independence. And the United States was the obvious place uh, to look. It does seem to mean, though, that this question as to whether we're more influenced in terms of our legal and political system by the United States on the one hand or by Britain on the other hand has now been overtaken by another dichotomy, which brings me finally uh, to, con when I say finally, uh, to continental Europe, which is the second substantive issue I want to consider uh, in this talk. Because I think more often now, the question for Ireland isn't the question that it was in the 1960s, which is should we follow Washington or should we follow London? The question now is, do we follow the Anglosphere view of the world or do we follow the continental European view of the world? The tension is between the Anglosphere view, which is a common law view, and the European view based largely on the experience of civil law jurisdictions. And some of this isn't about law at all. I think it's about politics and it's about economics. It's long been suggested in the literature that there are different nuances or different varieties of capitalism. Um, the literature tends to differentiate between two broad categories of economic model. The first is the liberal market economy, in which firms primarily coordinate activities through the outcome of interactions on a competitive market. And the liberal market economy is more associated with Anglophone countries such as the United States and the UK. The second is the coordinated market economy, in which there's a greater role for the state and non-market actors in directing economic activity. And that approach is more closely associated with many of the economies in continental Europe. And in matters of economics, this sort of dichotomy between the competing influences of Europe and the Anglosphere is one that Ireland must grapple with. When you look at Ireland today, in 2023, you have to observe that most of Ireland's modern economic success can be attributed to its ability to attract inward investment from some of the largest and most successful countries in the world. Many of these are international companies that have established themselves in Ireland, typically American businesses, in pharma, in tech, in life sciences, in financial services. And they are happy to do business in a country that speaks English, that has a well-educated workforce, that is appreciative of American culture, and that has a foothold in the vast EU internal market of 450 million consumers. So we have benefited from this juxtaposition between, on the one hand, our membership of the European Union, and on the other hand, our orientation towards the United States. But whilst influence from the United States has been very important, I think you would have to say now that Ireland has benefited enormously from our membership of the European Union. And that comes in different ways of analysis. Earlier this year, Ireland celebrated the 50th anniversary of our membership of the European Union. We joined in 1973. And when I traveled to Argentina and Chile, when the Irish government sent every representative it has to far-flung corners of the world. The Taoiseach or the Prime Minister always gets to go to Washington and presents a bowl of shamrock to the US President, but everybody down to the lowly Attorney General gets sent somewhere. And uh, on this occasion, I was um, uh, delegated to attend and host uh, St. Patrick's Day receptions in Santiago in Chile and in uh, Buenos Aires in Argentina. And on that trip, a big part of the theme that all the government representatives were espousing, including me, was noting the fact that this was a year of celebration for Ireland, 50 years in the European Union. And at a political level, I think one of the striking features in these polarized times in political terms in so many jurisdictions is that across the political divide in Ireland, notwithstanding the enormously turbulent development of Brexit, the United Kingdom leaving the European Union in very recent times, there is no political appetite whatsoever for Ireland to leave the EU. Support amongst Irish citizens for Irish membership of the European Union is extremely strong, uh, I would suggest, because there's a widespread recognition that it has been enormously advantageous and positive for Ireland. And 
Uh, moreover, although the point is somewhat unrelated because Ukraine is not at this point in time an EU member state, there has been an enormous humanitarian response in Ireland to the Ukrainian refugee crisis of the past 18 months. And I was delighted to meet a couple of um, Ukrainian visitors here just on my way in this afternoon. Uh, and let me say this, since Russia's um, illegal invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022, at that time, about 18 months ago, Ireland was accommoda accommodating 8,500 international protection applicants. We are now accommodating about 92,500. Um, we've scaled up by a factor of 11 in 18 months in terms of how many international applicants uh, for protection we are uh, accommodating. To put that another way, our national population rose by 1.65% solely on account of the influx of Ukrainian refugees in an 18-month period. So this is, um, on any view, significant migration. And one of the reasons that there's been no political dispute about that, because migration is, as you know, uh, very often a politically sensitive topic, is that it's a strong demonstration of European solidarity. And the Irish people have become used to freedom of movement between European people, which is a cornerstone of the European Union. So it doesn't seem that odd to us that lots of Ukrainians, although Ukraine is not at this time a member of the European Union, have come to Ireland, because lots of people from other European countries have come to Ireland previously also, because they've been able to exercise at a political level free movement uh, rights. And we've accepted that because it's part of the pact of European Union membership. Access to the EU's vast internal market of 450 million people is an integral part of Ireland's economic strength. Quite simply, it's important to be able to do business with your neighbours without tariffs or burdens. Through the founding treaties of the EU, Ireland has committed itself to establishing and maintaining a highly competitive social market economy, which is one of the core objectives of the European Union. Politically, though, that has consequences. The degree of economic integration between Ireland and its European neighbours means now that many economic decisions are not taken by Ireland as a freestanding country, but are taken by the EU at European level. So most obviously, we're now members of a single currency arrangement, the euro. We don't have our own currency anymore. We can't affect our interest rates, and we can't devalue our currency. Um, so whilst it might have been previously said that Ireland was closer to Boston than Berlin, I think the reality is, as you look at the European project over 50 years, and the level of economic integration that that implies, in many ways we have ceded some of our political and economic sovereignty to Europe. But that's a consensual pact. We've been willing to do it because Ireland has benefited enormously at an economic level from doing so. European integration, though, isn't just an economic project. It clearly has an important legal component also. You couldn't achieve economic integration to the extent that has been achieved by the European Union without having common legal rules that apply to all of the EU member states. And the EU institutions um, produce legislation. Some of that legislation has direct effect in each member state. Some of it is in the form of directives requiring member states to introduce domestic legislation to comply with European Union principles. And when Britain left the European Union, up to 60% of uh, British legislation was said to be EU legislation, either wholly EU legislation or British legislation that was introduced to achieve compliance with EU standards. So that is something that ultimately results over 50 years in a significant Europeanization of the Irish legal system. And our legal system has undoubtedly moved into a much more European space. Um, important doctrines of EU law, such as direct effect, whereby certain EU treaty provisions and regulations can be directly invoked in Irish courts without any domestic implementing legislation, mean that EU law isn't something that's out there in Brussels or Luxembourg. It's something that's in the Irish courts, um, available to Irish citizens to invoke every day of the week in Irish courts. There's also an important doctrine under EU law of supremacy, where EU law intrudes and it conflicts with the national law of a member state, EU law must have supremacy. 
the project wouldn't work otherwise. So EU law isn't some sort of arcane set of rules that you can blithely ignore when you don't um, agree with them or where, where you find them inconvenient. EU law is fundamental. It's part of the law of any EU member state. And under the Irish constitutional order, measures that are introduced by virtue of our membership of the European Union are incapable of being challenged constitutionally. That's a complete answer. So if something comes in because it must be done to comply with EU law, it can't be struck down on domestic legal grounds. Because if that could happen, then each country could, in an a la carte way, uh, chop out the bits of European Union law out of its domestic legal order that it didn't like. So without going into it in any further detail, I think it's fair to say that Ireland's legal system, as the legal systems of all member states of the European Union, has been radically affected and transformed over 50 years by our membership of the European Union. It's important also that you understand at a high level that when an EU law question arises before the court of a member state, there is a reference procedure whereby the Irish courts can refer that question to the Court of Justice in Luxembourg because a member state is not the authoritative voice on European Union law. The highest court on European Union law is the European Court of Justice. So even if a case is being litigated in the Irish Supreme Court, if the issue of controversy is one of EU law, then the Irish Supreme Court ought to refer the disputed question of EU law for an authoritative ruling to the Court of Justice in Luxembourg. And that's intended to provide a commonality of standard across 28 member states in the European Union, whereby everybody is bound by the same rules. Now, that's a striking um, infringement of national sovereignty, and it was the sort of thing that ultimately repelled the United Kingdom and caused them to withdraw um, from the court. But that's part and parcel of membership of the European Union. And to give you a sense of how often that reference procedure happens, Irish courts made 44 references in the first 30 years of membership. But between, in the five years between 2013 and 2018, 45 preliminary references were made. So this is becoming more and more prevalent as more difficult legal issues arise. And this constant dialogue and discourse between the courts of a national state and the courts of Europe. So um, that gives you a picture at a very high level at least of some of the implications and consequences for a country like Ireland um, in joining the EU. With the departure of um, the United Kingdom from the European Union, um, we are now the only substantive common law jurisdiction left. There are common law elements to Malta and Cyprus but they're much smaller countries and they're not primarily English-speaking countries. So that means that there's less of a common law Anglosphere voice in the European Union and Ireland is going to have to speak more loudly to ensure that its voice and the common law tradition are heard and respected. So, drawing all the strands together and concluding, I began in this lecture by asking the question whether Ireland was closer to Boston or Berlin, closer to Michigan or Madrid. And in summary, I would say to you the following. Ireland is a common law country with a significant political and legal inheritance shared with the United States from the United Kingdom. In our constitutional law tradition, the American uh, Supreme Court has been particularly influential in developing doctrines of fundamental rights in Ireland. Some of the formative moments in the legal history of the state, as it took its first steps, were marked by the influence of um, very uh, notable jurists on both sides uh, of the Atlantic, but particularly leading American judges. That influence was built on shared history and legal similarity, but also on personal friendships between individual judges. Today, when you look at Ireland in 2023, the economic relationship with the United States remains absolutely essential to Ireland's um, offering. To the extent that the reason why I'm in the States this week, uh, fitting in Michigan yesterday and today, is that I'm flying tomorrow morning to O'Hare Airport in Chicago 
to speak on behalf of the Irish government at events on Thursday and Friday in Chicago to promote an initiative called Ireland for Law, which, as its title suggests, is intended to promote Ireland as a legal hub for foreign business, in which we're seeking to leverage our post-Brexit competitive advantage for the US market of being the only English-speaking common law jurisdiction in the EU, a clear, I think, manifestation of the fact that Ireland has an enormous advantage still that continues in its political, legal, and economic positioning. Um, I think ultimately there's a nuanced relationship between Ireland and the United States on the one hand with whom we have closer cultural and historic ties and the U European Union on the other hand with whom we have increased economic, political and legal integration as a necessary function of our shared membership of the European Union. So the answer is it's a bit of both. It, depending on uh, which side of bed you get out of or what topic you're discussing, um, Ireland can be seen as closer um, to Michigan than Madrid. Certainly there's no question of Notre Dame going to play in front of 40,000 people in France or in Italy. Um, they would only come to Ireland for that purpose. Um, thank you so much for listening to me. Uh, I hope that what I've said will in some way have been of interest to uh, different people in the audience. And I've been told I'm now at liberty to take questions for a little while. So I'll pause there and allow people to pose questions. Thank you so much for, for this uh, fabulous lecture. And we do have time. We have people with uh, microphones. So I ask that um, you raise your hand. Um, and when Attorney General Fanning calls on you, that you perhaps say your name and uh, your affiliation. And then someone will bring a microphone to you. Yes. Hi, um, thank you for this talk. My name's Skylar. Um, I'm a third year at the law school here and I'm an aspiring public defender. So what you were saying about Gideon v. Wainwright impacting constitutional law in Ireland was very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, this is actually not a question, but just I, in case you don't already know, um, there's actually a named public interest scholarship at the law school now for your friend Jenny Grunkles. It's, it's in a footnote in the published uh, paper. I was aware oh, of that okay. fact. I just wanted to make sure that you knew. And they yeah. have a gala for it every year that yeah. I went to. No, I, 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 did, I did look up that. I mean, it, it, it was just a terrible thing, and I do think of it very often. She died, I think, in her 2L, after her 2L, in her 2L summer, if I can put it that way. Her summer between 2L year and her 3L year in an automobile accident but she was a very nice and friendly person in the lawyers club and I was living in the lawyers club and we had the meal plan and ate there every day and I saw her a lot at social events and she insisted on driving me to the airport so it was very um, when I was leaving Ann Arbor so it was very shocking that she died a year later and I'm really pleased that there's a continuing recognition of her name. Yeah there is my roommate got the scholarship last year so oh, it's going well, strong. And, and I'm delighted to hear it and I'm sure she'd be delighted if she was here to, to know that you were benefiting. This gentleman does not need to introduce himself to me. His name is Professor Don Regan, and he lectured me in American constitutional law when I was here 24 years ago. Okay. Hi, Ross. Nice to see you again. Uh, so I want to go back and ask a question about something very early in your talk, um, which is how did Ireland end up with proportional representation, which, of course, is a much more European continental thing than it is English or American, as you pointed out. How how did they get there? Um, there are books written about the drafting of the Constitution and the people who had an involvement in that. The dominant political figure of the time was um, Eamon de Valera, uh, who uh, was our political head of state between 1932 and 1948. The, constitu the new Constitution that contains the, the PR system was in 1937. So he was at the helm of government at, at that time. The person who the more evolved literature has given most credit for the um, cleverness of the Constitution um, was a civil servant called John Hearn, who's not terribly well known. You could find a Wikipedia profile about him now, but he's not even well known in Ireland. People in school wouldn't have heard of him. But he is the person who did most of the drafting. As to where he picked up the idea of that voting system from, I would need to go away and look at the literature again. But I think Hearn was regarded as the primary draftsman. And uh, it results in a system which has its strengths and its weaknesses. If you have a party with 7 or 8% of the national vote, it can probably get 7 or 8% of the seats. 
So that, in a way, is a good thing because the representation in Parliament is proportionate uh, to the voting strength, not mathematically, but roughly. The downside is that it's very hard for a party to have an overall majority under that system. So you get coalition governments. The current government in Ireland is a three-party coalition government. And at times, that can create instability. So if you look at the sort of post-Second World War history of Italian politics, for instance, um, and you count how many different governments there have been in Italy since 1945, it's closer to one a year than one every five years. And I don't mean to pick on Italy, um, but that's a particularly clear example of where fractured representation and coalition government makes government formation challenging. Um, so where we came up with it was, I think, a desire to break from Westminster and a desire to have a system that was fairer against the backdrop of smaller parties. In the United States for a very long time, there have really only been Republicans and Democrats. I know, taking a 30-year view that, you know, Ross Perot maybe was the last person to get any significant traction as a third-party candidate. Ralph Nader, not so much. But it's almost been impossible to sort of get any head of steam as a non-Republican Democrat politician. And, you know, it basically seems that a general election in the United States boils down to about, you know, 50,000 people living in particular places in Ohio, um, and everything hinges on them and the rest of the people in California and New York needn't bother showing up because it's kind of obvious what happens in those states. So that's an unusual political system where you have this sort of hinge of a relatively small amount of people in you no know, more than three or four states a couple of hundred thousand at most can sort of swing a general election. Um, but it does depend on what the, the electoral system does um, have important consequences long term because if you have a winner takes all system, you end up with only two parties. So traditionally in Britain, there were three parties, the Conservatives and Labour on about 20% and the Liberals on about, sorry, on about 40%, you know, and on a good election, one would have 45, one would have 30, the, the bad one would have 35. But it was that sort of two large parties. And then the Liberal Democrats, who might have 20% of the votes, but might get 2% of the seats. Because unless they came first in any particular electoral district, they wouldn't win a seat. So if you get 20% in every, in every, you know, one of 650 constituencies, you're not going to win any seats. Um, and that has always been regarded as a problem to the extent that uh, David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, when he was in coalition government between 2011 and 2015 with the Liberal Democrats, uh, con conceded to the proposition that there would be a referendum to change the voting system, to bring in the alternative vote, but the referendum was not carried. And the argument has always been, as in the United States, that first past the post means you get stable government and you don't get a splintered political system. And there are disadvantages to every political system. It'll, I suppose, come as a surprise to many that with 300 million American citizens, y you may be facing the choice that you may be facing um, in November 2024. Um, but in another system, if you had 17 or 18 different political parties all running um, for Congress, I mean, how would you get coherent legislating in Congress? So there are upsides and downsides to every system. But it was, I think, an evolved view that wanted to move away from the Westminster tradition. Gentleman there in the red sweater, I think. Hi, thank you so much for this Sorry. talk. Um, mm. It was super enlightening and interesting. Um, my name is Birch, and I work as a researcher at the Institute for Social Research here at Michigan. Um, my question's a bit complicated, so I'll try to distill it as best I can. Um, but in my understanding, um, which is limited of Irish history, um, Irish people were the population directly colonized by the United Kingdom um, prior to independence. Um, and the situation in the United States was obviously a bit different. Um, British subjects came to America um, as generally willingly as colonial subjects and then later became disillusioned with the colonial situation, um, which led to the, the War of Independence. Um, and one of the reasons for this was that um, Anglo-American colonists in what is now the United States sought further license to continue colonizing the milieu of indigenous nations upon whose territory they came to reside. Um, and you can see um, these sort of protections and debates about um, rights to land speculation and uh, rights to own other human beings sort of enshrined in American legal history. And so I guess what I'm wondering is in your view, um, 
how have these very different relationships to a common colonizer shaped the legal trajectories of the United States in comparison to Ireland, um, in which, you know, in, in Ireland we have Irish people sort of seeking their own independence and branching off from Britain, and in the American situation you have these sort of two layers of colonialism in which you have the indigenous population as well as um, Anglo-American colonists who came to see themselves as distinct from Britain but still um, not indigenous to the territory in which they sought to build their nation. Okay, you're right, that is a complicated question. <laughs> um, like doing my best to respond to it, I, I'm not sure I can answer it, but uh, doing my best to respond to it, um, I suppose the point I was making in the paper was uh, there was a sharper break with sort of the Declaration of Independence, the new federal constitution. There was def definitely a sharper break. Uh, it was a new, totally republican constitution. And although inevitably there were inheritances um, from people who were fundamentally of English tradition or of English ancestry in terms of how they spoke and how they thought about legal matters, it was a, a much newer departure in the United States than it was in Ireland. When in Ireland we got partial independence in 1922 and fuller independence in 1937, the lawyers had all worked under English law. Um, the systems, you know, the politicians, some of them had been politicians in the Westminster Parliament. So it was inevitable that we were going to copy all the good bits that we liked. And as a consequence, um, we've always had to strike that, I suppose, difficult balance between, on the one hand, wanting to project our own um, identity as a modern independent republic, and some things are very different, like, the, you know, for instance, the complete absence of the role of the monarch, and the fact that we've no titles of nobility. So these are things we share with the United States. There's nobody called Lord anybody or Sir anybody in Ireland, and the Constitution prohibits the conferring of any titles of nobility of that type. Just like in a Republican, um, in a Republic like the United States, there's no Lord anybody. So in many ways, the countries have approached the task similarly, but it is interesting as a sort of a, a legal and political anthropological exercise to look backwards and say, well, what bits have you retained? Notwithstanding that you said it's a clean break and you're starting again, which bits did you more or less copy anyway? And um, there are examples in both jurisdictions at a legal and political level of quite a lot of inheritance. And laws actually, although this isn't specifically a law lecture, law is actually really the best example of that. So if you have an automobile accident today and you sue in tort in Michigan, um, the negligence test that determines whether the person who crashed into your vehicle is responsible is going to be remarkably similar in Michigan or in London or in Dublin because the, the common law inheritance in all those jurisdictions means the legal systems still closely resemble each other. So I don't know that that's a perfect response. I mean, you asked a question about the second layer of colonialism in the States, but I, I find it difficult to adapt to the points I'm making to address that particular consideration. At the back, yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Gregory Severn. I'm a master's public policy student at the Ford School here. And <clears throat> you mentioned earlier the what seems to me to be a stark acceleration in the EU law structure superseding the Irish Constitution and the referral of cases from the Irish Supreme Court to the courts in Luxembourg. Do you see this trend continuing or accelerating further? And if so, do you foresee this being a source of tension in Irish domestic politics as it was in the UK or maybe spilling over into other EU member states? Well, I think that really is an excellent question. Um, I think 50 years ago, the level of integration that we've reached now would have been unthinkable. But when something happens gradually, it's, it's less noticeable. It's sort of like you know, the frog boiling in water um, as the water gradually heats up. Um, I think 30, 25 years ago, there was probably a concern that the European project was going to just continue inexorably until you had, in effect, a federal government in Europe, much in the same way that you have a federal government in Washington. I think, though, it's reached an equilibrium point now where 
there is probably not much political support in any of the member states to trade in more domestic national sovereignty in return for greater integration and greater European rule. So the European currency was really biting off a very big piece of the apple, if I could put it that way. And to get member states to agree to go into a single currency was a major political development. But my sense is it's probably not going to go much further than that for the foreseeable future. But of course, the, the, you know, the, the future is ultimately a very long time. I don't really see political support amongst member states for a greater transfer of sovereignty than there is at the moment. Um, whilst it is true that the Irish Supreme Court and Supreme Courts are apex courts from other member states, do have to refer EU law issues to the Luxembourg Court. It's only in areas where there is an EU law issue at stake. And there are only EU law issues at stake where EU law has um, sovereignty. So there are spheres of autonomy for national member states where you can legislate according to your own views. So the law in Ireland is not the same as France on lots of different things. So member states in, for instance, the justice sphere can impose totally different penalties on, you know, you know different um, uh, breaches of the law. So for instance, like the age of consent for sex could be different from one European Union state to another. The age of um, legal entitlement to purchase alcohol could be different. So like fairly fundamental things, the age to purchase tobacco, nicotine uh, products in, in use agents could be different. So it's not the case that EU law exists in every sphere of an individual's life. Speed limits can be different on the road. So there are lots of sort of banal examples that everybody in their sort of daily life must confront, which are set by the member state and not set by the EU. But where the EU does have competence, which in turn is something that's defined under the EU treaties, then EU law has supremacy and all member states have to act in accordance with a common standard. You're going to get a microphone, Dick. Yeah, thank you. My name is Dick Calderazzo. Thank you. Um, as a follow-up to that question and just what you gave, is there any specific examples where these referrals are given and what particular EU law is trying to be enforced over the High Court in Ireland? Well, I, I can, not that easy to answer that question. Let me, give you a, let me give you a sense of like the legal friction between a member state and the European Union. Um, where a member state is in breach of European Union law, the government of the European Union, which in itself is a very difficult uh, thing to describe, but the entity that most looks like the government is the European Commission. In fact, political power is dispersed between the European Council, which is the heads of state, or if it meets in other forms, the ministers for agriculture or the ministers for finance. But that's one institution in the EU, but another important institution in the EU is the European Commission. If the European Commission takes the view that Ireland, or for that matter, Portugal or Italy, is in breach of European Union law, it can ultimately uh, embark on a process that can lead to litigation, where they can bring what are called infringement proceedings against a member state. So one of the um, joys of my job is that I defend Ireland in legal proceedings both before the domestic courts in Ireland, but also before international courts. So there are multiple sets of what we call infringement proceedings that are in being at present, where the Commission, the European Commission, would be suing Ireland um, for breaches of European Union law. And what, where, where that would arise would uh, include a situation where the EU had set down some common tariff or standard that had to be reached by all member states by, say, 2022. Now, they might have set that down in 2017 and given everybody five years to achieve that common standard, but some countries would be slow and would not have reached it yet. And if you hadn't reached it, the EU could bring proceedings against the member state before the Court of Justice, and the power of the Court of Justice would include the levying of fines and the making of orders compelling um, uh, that member state to come into line. So you, you get different problems. Most of them are economic issues about tariffs and barriers to trade. If there's an excessive regulation by a particular member state, that could be a barrier to trade. 
and that could be said to be in breach of the treaty, um, which fundamentally is about freedom of trade. Or if workers from Italy were in some way treated less favorably than workers from Ireland, if they came to work in Ireland, that would be a breach of the EU treaty, which guarantees free movement and guarantees equivalence of treatment to nationals of different member states. So it's that sort of thing that would normally arise, where, for instance, a, a welfare benefit that might be available to an Irish citizen it mightn't be available to an Italian citizen. That would be discrimination that wouldn't be permitted under EU law. Now, I'm just making them up as hypotheticals. I'd, I'd best not give, I suppose, examples of actual conflicts that I'm advising the Irish government on. But, but, and just to be clear, Ireland is not uh, performing poorly in the class. There are other member states that are the subject of many more sets of infringement proceedings than Ireland. So you obviously don't want to be at the bottom of the class and we're trying to improve our ranking all the time, but we're, we're at least in the middle of the pack and maybe at the slightly better end than the middle, if I can put it that way. I will ask the last question, if I may. Uh, you may. There was one lady looking to get in at the back. Um, uh, I mean, too, and Oksana. But I have, I mean, because this is, this is precisely on that topic. Um, when you have, basically, rogue states like Poland, basically not um, changing their courts, uh, being sanctioned by the EU, but those sanctions actually don't have much teeth. Um, and they go on and continue acting badly uh, as members of the EU and still get subsidies, etc. So what is there that the EU can do in, 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 in nation states like this, where basically they argue for their sovereignty and they contravene not necessarily specific treaties, uh, but their own constitutions? Well, I think the question of what disciplinary measures could be adopted by the European Union against a member state that is consistently in breach is probably a topic that's a little bit above my pay grade. I, I mean, I'm not speaking for the European Union. From my perspective, I'm the legal advisor to the government of one member state, but I, I do recognize the significance of the question that you ask. and. There are concerns, particularly about Poland, you're right to say that, um, in terms of a number of Polish laws and whether they are compliant with EU rule of law principles. And where that goes, ultimately, I'm not sure. Um, Brexit has created an unwelcome precedent. Uh, until Brexit, the European Union was a club that everybody was dying to join. And the rules were never really adapted for a situation where people would leave. And the same questions that might arise if, you know, California succeeded from the union, you know, how does that work, basically? Um, what happens? You know, you already share a border with Canada and Mexico, so, you know, figure out what that means if you have a third-party country sharing a, a land border with you. But you have to reach trade agreements, you know. So there's, there's lots of questions that arise. Uh, I'm not presuming for a moment that California would leave the Union, but I'm saying that these interesting questions provoke the same intellectual analysis that has to occur when a country leaves the European Union. And I I'm not sure that we want to get to the point of expelling members of the European Union, but perhaps ultimately that's an area that we could get to if countries um, over the long term demonstrate a complete disregard or disinclination to abide by the, mem by the rules of the club. I mean, if you're a member of a tennis club or a golf club and you smash up the premises and the, the secretary writes to you and says you're in breach of the rules and you do it a second or third time, uh, at some point somebody will presumably decide um, that your violation of the rules of the club is such that you ought to be expelled and your membership entitlements be removed from you. So I I'm not sure ultimately if the analysis is much more complicated than that. Um, at a very high level, but what precisely would trigger that sort of outcome is a matter for the European Union, not a matter for me to comment on. But there are several uh, parliamentary elections this fall, which will be interesting to follow um, and impactful potentially for the EU and, and politics in the EU. For, for, for sure. And there's always a question about whether sentiment in individual EU countries is going to turn against the EU. And that's why the Brexit piece is uh, so important. If Brexit was deemed to be an enormous success and everybody in Britain was saying, well, this is wonderful, why didn't we do it much sooner? Then other member states would be turning around saying, well, why don't we, why are we sitting around like losers? Why don't we, you know, charge towards the exit door like they have done? 
But at the moment, um, if anything, the perception is that Britain is having what might be described as buyer's remorse and that there's no real indication that Brexit has been a success. Its inconveniences and its drawbacks have become apparent over time. Its advantages have been slow in revealing themselves, if they exist at all, other than the facial um, assertion of sovereignty that goes with it. But that's a sort of bumper sticker analysis. Once you actually get into the nitty gritty of uh, British firms trying to export goods to France and Germany, not many of them are finding uh, Brexit a very convenient uh, modus operandi. So if Brexit is not a great success for the UK, um, I think that in itself will secure the future of the um, European Union. And who knows what the future holds? Um, perhaps the most insightful political commentator in um, the UK is Janan Ganesh, who writes for the um, Financial Times. He wrote a column about two or three months ago in which he expressed the view that everybody now realizes that Brexit was a terrible mistake but that it'll take a generation before people can actually act on that fact. And everybody who is currently involved in politics will have to have left politics. And perhaps in a generation's time, his prophecy will turn out to be true. I don't know that it will, but he's one of the more insightful columnists that you can read on the topic. Well, on that note, I want to thank you very much on behalf of all of us at the Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. And uh, we hope you'll be coming back before 24 years. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much.